Hello, my fellow readers. It's been a while since I made any recordings, so hopefully I'll remember how to do this. Uh, today it's back to the early 19th century and the Napoleonic Wars to talk about this beast of a novel, Vanity Fair, published by William Makepeace Thackeray, originally as a serial novel, or that is a sequence of shorter publications released in installments over a longer period of time. Uh, sort of like the much older equivalent of a weekly podcast or TV series. Although nowadays that concept is feeling increasingly archaic too, as it seems most of the TV dramas also tend to come in whole seasons at once, I guess producers in the modern era aren't confident in their audience's abilities to sustain focus across weekly intervals, uh, which is maybe true if you watch my uh, review on Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. But I digress. Vanity Fair is a brilliant satire of English society, particularly in the upper classes, or maybe more precisely the aspiring social climbers. A social milieu, which Thackeray terms Vanity Fair, a sort of connecting critique which will stick with readers throughout the novel. It paints the portraits of a wide variety of characters, uh, most of them quite unlikable and all of them seriously flawed, making them the butt of this novel-length joke to which the author and his readers are privy. I think I somehow managed to snatch the Audible edition of this book for free at some point, as part of my membership. In any case, it sat in my library for a while until I listened to an excellent review by Municorn from uh, one of my favorite channels, The Bookish Land, a review that I'll refer to a few times in my own review, so I'll link it below. Actually, I watched several really good in-depth reviews on this book after finishing it. Uh, it's really that kind of a book where there's enough going on that you'll want to hear what others have to say so you can catch aspects you missed. Like, in a strange way, it actually made me miss those in-depth chapter-by-chapter discussions we used to have back in my high school literature classes. Not the homework assignments or the exams, of course, but the process of really digesting a classic like Huckleberry Finn or Crime and Punishment and taking it just one chapter at a time to make sure we really all caught as much as we possibly could from it. Anyway, though, Municorn from The Bookish Land praised this book in spite of its uh, massive length for its often unlikable characters that could still be nevertheless endearing at times, inviting a complicated relationship between the reader and these characters. The first of those characters, though less obviously a character, is the narrator himself, who never fails to remind you of his presence in case you might have forgotten about him, and you won't. He's voiced in the edition I listened to by David Frederick Case, aka Frederick Davidson, who was a prolific narrator and I think has also narrated some of the mystery stories I've listened to, such as Dorothy Sayers' Lord Peter Whimsey novels and uh, G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown series, some of which I've reviewed previously on my channel. And in this present role, he certainly delivers a perfectly conveying the mocking attitude the narrator conveys towards his objects of examination. Some commentaries on the novel simply refer to the narrator as Thackeray, perfectly equating him with the author of the book. I suppose this is true, but for me it isn't all that helpful because Thackeray is still in character as he's telling the story. Or is he? I guess it's up to you to decide whether you consider the narration a perfect reflection of Thackeray's own attitudes towards these characters, or if he intends to use this character as a slight buffer between himself and the actual story, which is what I assumed. In any case though, the narrator is a personality who will pretty quickly make you wonder, who is this guy? And do I even trust him? From the start, he doesn't feel emotionally removed enough from his story to totally rely on his accounts. And at first this made me question whether we could even trust that his opinions about the characters are accurate. So we almost have to read between the lines of what he says and then see for ourselves whether the characters' actions stack up with what he's telling about them. Which I'd say, by and large, they do, but again, you can be the judge of that. And for a guy who's appointed himself as the man to expose the vanity and treachery of these characters, he does display this ironic sort of self-importance in telling us this story. It's hard not to wonder why he's telling us this story. Like, towards the beginning of the novel, I was thinking I could almost imagine him uh, turning out to be some guy who was spurned by one of these two women whose stories he's telling, and thus has taken it upon himself to expose all of her follies in the guise of a social commentary. But throughout the novel, we come to take his world a little more at face value as it progresses, and his societal commentaries feel very on point. Uh, it's just funny because his style almost begs for a meta-level consideration of what the author was trying to achieve with the narrator himself. Like, in a way, he perfectly illustrates the human tendency to gawk and point fingers at the ills of society and of our neighbors in a way that is entertaining and absolutely valid, but if stopped at that point, effectively shields us from any need for further self-reflection, rather than forcing us to consider if we embody any of these same ills 
uh, or even different ones, ourselves to a lesser extent. Unicorn from the bookish land also observed that the author often tends to spoil his own story pretty far in advance, which is something I normally kind of notice without too much conscious attention. But here, since I was already primed by her review, I laughed to myself every time I saw him doing it which is pretty often. He also has these amusing mannerisms that give the book some style, uh, such as a habit of saying, I needn't tell you that, or for the sake of brevity, I'll omit a description of, and then going on to elaborate at length on the thing that he didn't tell us. And on the flip side, he often justifies why he thought some detail or side story was worth including, which is all pretty funny since the tale is like a thousand pages or more long, full of slightly or very extraneous details. So any claim of being a concise narrative seems pretty laughable. Indeed, by the end of this book, you might even find yourself a bit frustrated at times with the narrator, all as you keep laughing at this tendency, because even with 10% of the book left to go, we'll still hear him expounding on how Sir Huddleston Fuddleston's party was received or something like that. And yes, I thought it was hilarious how, without betraying what he's doing at all, he constantly refers to certain auxiliary characters by these mocking names that couldn't possibly be real people's names, like Sir Huddleston Fuddleston or Lady Bearacres, that's Bear, B-A-R-E, or another late emerging character, his transparency Lord Tapeworm, whose intentions, unobserved by one of our main characters, are clearly to seduce that character's sister and not as our clueless Joseph Sedley believes, to endow Joss with some new and special fortune or nobility, as he clearly believes. So yeah, the writing style and narration style is hilarious, but I'd also just pace yourself, because depending on the mood you're in at the time, these asides can either be wildly amusing or oh so boring. I mean, there's a reason why I finished this novel about four months after starting it, despite actually liking it quite a lot. Without further ado, though, let's get into the actual story. At its heart, it centers on two young women, Becky and Amelia, from the moment they finish their schooling together to the time they've reached middle age and have been through marriages, born children, and much more. Though these two characters share many acquaintances and often cross paths, their stories are less intertwined than you might believe at the start. Instead, they end up pretty much right from the start serving as foils to one another. That is, we observe how certain differences, both in their parentage and their personalities and decisions, uh, lead to drastically different outcomes in life. The narrator is explicit from the first chapter about how Amelia is a lovely young woman and Becky isn't. And even if we don't fully trust the narrator yet, we can pretty much buy into this portrayal from the way Becky seems to maneuver and manipulate others in a way that is very soon transparent to the reader, but not so much to everyone around her. Amelia is more challenging, however, because although we're told how lovely a woman she is and how favored she is by all her classmates and by men and yada, 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 we don't immediately see any evidence that this attraction is at all due to her own merit. And indeed, her friend Becky seems to be attached to her merely for personal gain, to which poor Amelia seems almost entirely oblivious. We see that Amelia quite generally seems to be a lousy assessor of character, as she seems oblivious not only to Becky's scheming, but also to her brother Joseph's flaws, her suitor George Osborne's prejudices against the lower classes, and his general self-absorption and the like. And so right from the beginning, we're shown one character, Becky, who, by the narrator's own admission, hasn't been given much by society and therefore must take it upon herself to achieve her own success, to which she employs her guile and personal charm to their fullest, even stooping to levels that are usually not condoned by polite society. And she's juxtaposed here with another character, Amelia, who's been given quite a lot by society, was born into an esteemed enough family, and has never wanted for anything during her childhood and early life, and thus has adopted quite a passive attitude, uh, since at least thus far in life, a good things come to her without any real effort on her part. Though the narrator encourages us to at least somewhat prefer Amelia to Becky, at least in a moral assessment, we can't help thinking how the two might have turned out differently should their upbringings and societal roles have been swapped. And naturally, I was curious to see how their characters progressed through the remaining 900 or so pages. Although, as was probably the case for many readers, and as was the case for most of the characters in the novel, I was generally a lot more intrigued by Becky than Amelia. And then at that point, after the introduction, we get this brilliant interlude from the narrator where he admonishes his readers, I've been receiving a bunch of letters from you insulting Miss Amelia and complaining how boring she is and we don't need to see any more from her. Whether this is actually true is hard to say, but it is actually possible because remember this novel was originally published as a serial novel. So he basically chastises us all saying, you're just like everyone else who loves to criticize a kind-hearted woman with good fortune Let's take, for example, her sister's in law, and then he proceeds into the story about how they too have such a negative view of her because um, they're jealous of her. And I love the way here in which the author nudges his readers not simply to dismiss Amelia as a dull character as we were wont to do, but to start looking more into this dullness to see what is it that makes Amelia so dull and what are the results of it. 
And as the next few chapters proceed, we see more development of this contrast between Amelia and Becky. Amelia is indeed dull and passive. She's never had to work too hard for anything, but just lets life's advantages come to her instead of seizing them for herself. And yet so far, this has worked just fine for her, which perhaps explains why, although she might not have a strongly positive or kind personality like Major Dobbin or someone like that, uh, she hardly comes across as a villain. We can at least believe the narrator when he says she is charming and kind-hearted, even though we see there is not really much depth or awareness to this kind-heartedness. It's sort of just following the rules that society has given her. Uh, but at the same time, we can't help but consider where Becky would have gotten if she adopted such a passive attitude in life. The answer is probably nowhere. In Becky, we have a character who is a social climber, steering events to her favor, and occasionally we see these hints of jealousy or vindictiveness against those who have slighted her, or even those like Amelia who simply were dealt better cards than her in life. And on one hand, we want to dislike Becky for acting in this way, but on the other hand, we wonder whether she is really doing the right things in a practical sense, not in a moral sense, but a practical sense, because does she really have any other option that wouldn't result in her simply being thrown about by others' whims? It's the very things that make Becky dislikable that actually bestow upon her her own agency in a society where women don't have much agency, where people of a lower social class don't have much agency, and where even women who are well off can find themselves in a nasty predicament if they're too passive. And as the novel progresses, we see Amelia basically enter into this pitiable state of existence, not that she's really in poverty, but the reader can clearly see how Amelia's tendency to follow the rules and uphold the values that are supposedly esteemed by Vanity Fair leads her to a life in which she's basically just steamrolled by everything that occurs to her as she takes it lying down. And she herself remains mostly oblivious to this, other than pining after her once and only love, George Osborne, who we can all agree really was not worthy of her, in spite of our opinion of Amelia herself. She fails to develop any self-awareness or real character at all. In fact, it almost feels like her spurned admirer, Major Dobbin, who pretty much consecrates his entire life to caring for her and kissing her feet, knows her better than she knows herself. His own reflections about her offer more insight to her character than her own inner monologues, though he also never fails to gloss over her weaknesses and paint the rosiest picture of her. Even though we can kind of tell that he's not totally oblivious to her weaknesses, he's kind of just chosen not to see them. And at the same time, as the author paints this picture of the society, he cleverly shows us how Becky is someone who intricately understands the rules of Vanity Fair. She grasps this distinction between how society says they want her to behave and how she actually needs to behave if she wants to get anywhere, all while still appearing to meet these standards that society is imposing on her. It's a tough game. The author starts to raise this very real challenge to the reader. Imagine someone who is a good person in the traditional sense, who cares an iota about things outside of herself, and who still stands any chance at reaching and retaining a comfortable position within society. As we read, this increasingly feels like a complete impossibility, an internal contradiction. The society Thackeray is describing implicitly incentivizes duplicity and vanity, while squelching out the more positive human qualities that it still claims to admire in people. And on the rare occasions where people do actually espouse these qualities, the would-be virtuous individuals are just ruthlessly disparaged behind their backs. For a story that centers on Amelia and Becky, though, there are plenty of other characters near the center of it all who receive a lot of attention and typically also scorn from the narrator. It's an admittedly superficial, but I think still an interesting question to ask, who's your least favorite character in this novel? Or I should say instead, which character is the most satisfying and ridiculous mockery of a real human archetype? For me, the hedonistic coward Joss Sedley is a pretty strong candidate. Uh, maybe, in fact, he's too good of a candidate for this role, as he's so ridiculous he feels quite cartoonish at times. Though he's by no means a real mover or shaker in this novel, he's a frequent source of humor. One of the most perfect incidences, in my opinion, is the infamous circumstances under which he earns the narrator's uh, calling him the nickname Waterloo Sedley for the rest of the novel, uh, which is all the funnier because it's a title that Joseph Sedley himself would be proud of, completely missing its irony in describing a man who instantly fled from what was to become an English victory at Waterloo, and then for the remainder of his life uh, would humbly recount his presence at this famous battle and casual conversations whenever the opportunity arose. Or for a less funny event, but one that permanently cements Joseph Sedley's status as not just a boneheaded, but also a deeply selfish character, there's the treatment he gives his dying father when he briefly returns to town near the end of the book, calling in sick on the day he's scheduled to visit his father as he totally disregards the old man and instead makes his way around the local drinking establishments, filling up on grub and booze, and only when he finally shows up at the end of the day showing some uh, belated attention to his father, 
but still without any real remorse or reflection on the day's actions. But it's not just the really bad eggs like Joseph Sedley that the narrator tears apart in Vanity Fair. Even the noble slash pathetic Major William Dobbin, one of the most redeemable characters in this novel, receives his share of abuse, and probably rightfully so. Many readers call Dobbin the hero of this novel, or cast him as pretty much good and virtuous to the very end, which is sort of true, but I think it's worth probing into this goodness a bit deeper. Uh, in contrast with Amelia, who basically refuses to play the game of Vanity Fair and lies down without fighting, Dobbin is the rare person who manages to achieve financial success and some modicum of respect in society, all while putting others' interests first and remaining an all-around good person. Yet, the people whose interests he most often puts first are seldom deserving of his help. Dobbin basically serves as a constant enabler for his friends' vanities and vices as he buys out their debts and facilitates relationships such as a match between his own darling Amelia and his friend George Osborne at everyone's expense, not least of all his own. He has this core value of loyalty where once he's chosen to stand by a person's side, he will defend and support that person to the very end and overlook that person's every flaw. In some ways, he has parallels to uh, Stevens, the butler in uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's Remains of the Day, who also has these core values that actually do him harm in the end, but he just cannot let go of. So Dobbin's flaw is that he just has this very static view of the characters of the people around him that simply can't be altered once it's set in stone because he feels like that would be a betrayal to them. And the financial rewards he does receive for his service are hardly a consolation to him because for him, there is one great prize in life one woman whom he'll ever love for reasons that are really frustratingly unjustifiable throughout the novel. It's a cruel irony that Amelia can't let go of her long gone and frankly unworthy husband due to this misplaced sense of devotion, while in reality, it's only an equally misplaced sense of devotion that keeps Dobbin fawning over dear Amelia over a decade after their first meeting. Dobbin is your stereotypical nice guy in modern speech in both the positive and negative connotations. He's a guy who is genuinely a good guy in many regards, but to an extent where he completely neglects his own needs, even leading to a certain blindness of those very needs and a failure to question more deeply why these loyalties to his friends and to Amelia herself are so important, or to ask what would happen if he actually just once let down one of these unworthy companions. Just once. And in fact, although he undoubtedly has the best of intentions, and although his way of treating people around him is by far more admirable than most anyone we meet in Vanity Fair, at the root of it all, we still have to question the fundamental purity of his motivations, as the narrator frequently does. Though some might view Dobbin as a genuinely nice guy, others might see him also as a man without real self-reflection, a people-pleaser who at the end of the day behaves nicely not out of some fundamentally pure goodness, but because it protects him from the discomfort of confronting the contradictions in the world around him and within him. It's a sense of goodness, of loyalty, his nice guy nature that keeps him attached to the hopes of marriage to a woman who is ultimately not really worth his while, because Dobbin's notion of a good person would forgive Amelia her faults and would be true to her even if she fails to value him. So Amelia's rejection of Dobbin's advances while maintaining him as a friend are again born of this, in my opinion, misguided but understandable value of loyalty, not to mention a certain blindness to actual character. This man George Osborne, to whom she was married, was pretty much a scoundrel, and had he lived, one can only guess that the relationship between the two would have been a tale of misery and woe for Amelia. Yet this final brief reconciliation between the two right before George's death at war managed to immortalize this final view of him in Amelia's mind as a saint and martyr, dashing any chances that she'll ever be able to move on from this loss of her husband, of whom the best that can be said of him during his life was that he pretty much ignored her and left her to herself as he philandered in English society. This isn't the only time, for that matter, that Thackeray critiques this human tendency to remember people by their last words uttered on their deathbed, instead of considering them holistically as human beings with an entire life behind them. Uh, it's a tendency that my friend Davout Gosley also critiqued on his channel a while back in an excellent reflection upon the novel Don Quixote. I think it's a really funny and sometimes totally misleading human pattern when we stop for a moment to think about it, but it's a trap we can easily fall into. And one might even wonder if Thackeray intended this relationship between George and Amelia as a rebuttal to his other contemporaries who wrote romance novels in which the two characters get together and it's the end of the story, without ever questioning what happens from there. Actually, come to think of it, he must have, because I think his narrator actually makes an aside uh, after Amelia and George get married about how most novels end in marriage, but for his, this is where it truly begins. Let us see now how the star-crossed lovers thrive and prosper within the cruel world of Vanity Fair. Now, 
on this topic, it is worth mentioning the way that the romance turns out in the end. William Dobbin and Amelia Osborne, nay Sedley, uh, do get together in an ending that I think actually worked excellently, because given the circumstances, it's neither fully satisfying nor unsatisfying. Had the two gotten together earlier, I think it would have been profoundly unsatisfying from a literary perspective, but instead they only get together after Amelia has wounded Dobbin quite deeply and forced him to let go of this exalted view he has of her. Thus, some readers, actually many, uh, view this ending as a somewhat of a tragedy. Dobbin only wins the prize he's been pursuing, a romantic relationship with Amelia, uh, at the point when he's finally realized it's no longer everything he imagined it to be. I, on the other hand, saw it as a bit more of a possible happy ending for the two. Uh, contrary to the traditional happily ever after romance in which the lover's view of one another is pretty much untarnished, Amelia and Dobbin's relationship represents a more realistic marriage in which Dobbin has seen Amelia's deep faults and truly recognized them instead of dismissing them, but chooses to marry her anyway and maybe even get to know her in less of this idealized perfection that he's trapped himself in up until this point. It's a step of maturity for Dobbin to move beyond this idealistic view of Amelia, and it's a huge step of maturity, albeit one that will probably feel small in the eyes of the readers, for Amelia to rewrite her mental story of her life in a way that finally lets go of the figure of George as an immaculate hero and savior, and makes room for other possibilities. And as in real life, it's not clear to the reader whether Dobbin's choice to marry Amelia anyway was the right choice, or whether there even was a right choice, but it is the choice that he made, and I think it has some potential. Now, there are so many other characters that are worthy of attention in this novel, but I'm just going to leave them out of my non-comprehensive review analysis and just wrap things up, because this is a book that I could go on for hours. This really deserves a whole course about it if you really wanted to get into a deep analysis. I do encourage you, though, to watch some of the other reviews that I'll be linking below, because like I said, the video reviews I found for this book are really a cut above the ones I normally find, at least for my personal stylistic preferences. I mean, I really like reviews where people go in deeply and break down the novel uh, for, for quite a while talking about what they found in it. And uh, the ones that I'll be linking do indeed do that, and I really enjoyed them. The portrait of society that the narrator paints in Vanity Fair is, at times, an exceedingly pessimistic one. Is it too much so? And what influence did it have on its readership and upon broader society? Unfortunately, I personally really lack the historical context to properly address those questions here without a lot of further historical research, but I think they're important to the fullest understanding of the novel, and I'd love to hear if you have thoughts about this or know of other sources that discuss this well. But thanks for watching this longer review on a classic British novel. It'll probably be a little while before I make it through my next classic of this length, but I will be back with another one at some point, I'm sure. Have a great rest of the day, and happy reading.